Okay, so welcome everyone to the Maastricht Migration Lecture Series. We're very happy to have this first kickoff lecture of 2021. Of course, it has to be virtually, but we're still happy to have everyone here, of course. The, I guess the silver lining to this is that it's easier to get people from further afield, like our speaker today, who's calling in from the United States. Um, and it's also easier to have a wider reach for people to be able to join online. So of course, there are also positives with the situation. So this lecture series is a, a joint project of the Refugee Project Maastricht, the Maastricht Young Academy, the Maastricht Center for Citizenship, Migration and Development, and the UN Student Association, and UNU Merit. And the objective of this series is to provide an objective picture on the topic of migration and offer new insights to the general public. So the idea here is that we have access to a lot of different academics, both internally and externally, to share their knowledge to the general public on a topic that is often very much misunderstood. And today I'm really excited to have Ali Shadar with, with us who is going to be speaking to us about race and migration in the United States and in Europe. So two topics that are, well, highly topical and, and areas that are important to be seen together and to, but are often not talked about together. So I think we're gonna have a really stimulating discussion today. So uh, um, Dr. Sharari is a North American sociologist specializing in migration, intergroup dynamics, civil society organizations and music. He's an assistant professor of sociology at Rutgers University and a fellow at the International Migration Institute in Amsterdam. He was previously a Marie Curie postdoc fellow based at the University of Oxford, where he researched the domestic and homeland oriented political activities of migrants in Europe. And his, his writing and his scholarship appears in prominent academic journals all over the world. So we're very, very happy to have him with us to get, uh, today. And again, thank you for calling in from the US. We're really excited to also see these perspectives from North America and from Europe juxtaposed and, and compared. So thank you again, Ali, for being with us. Just some housekeeping rules. Um, Ali will speak to us for about 40, 45 minutes. And then after that, I will stop the recording and we'll open up the floor to questions. You can either ask your questions in the chat or you can raise your hand and you can actually ask your questions um, well, live in person. I'll unmute you and then you're welcome to do it that way also. So as you wish, uh, but please do, we are very interested to have you engaged and Ali is happy to take lots of your questions. So until then, Ali, the floor is yours. Thank you for being with us. All right, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here and it's great. And it's too bad I didn't get to actually travel to Maastricht because I always enjoy visiting, but I'm hope, hoping that the talk today will be of uh, some interest. This is a bit a way, not a traditional kind of academic talk where I'm going to uh, show you some specific study I've done and talk about the results and what it means, but it's more of a broader, uh, more of a historical kind of talk, a bit of an intellectual history to think about how these concept, the concept of race, how that has effectively evolved in the United States in the in social sciences and how it's intersected with immigration throughout the 20th century in the US context. And part of my idea is, or I've been thinking about the ways to, to see, are there ways that these processes can be uh, used to understand what's happening today in a lot of different newer kind of societies that are in, having increasing immigration, often in places like Europe and other, other places in the global South as well. So the idea for today then was to do a couple, a few different things. So one was to kind of think about some of these recent events that have happened in which there's been increasing uh, discussions about race and issues around race and issues around police uh, bias and police violence against racial ethnic minorities on both sides of the pond, right? So we've had these protests happening in, in, in Europe and in the US. So there's been a lot of discussion, a bit of backlash about that. And I want to then move into this intellectual history to think about how these ideas of race immigration have kind of been theorized and studied in the social sciences in the United States. And then circle back to think about to what extent can these ideas help us think about some of the intergroup dynamics and, and social processes that are unfolding in Western Europe today. So the uh, last summer, 
we saw alarming rays of protests happening in response to police violence in the United States. And it's really something that's become quite cyclical in the summers. We've had several protests. These pictures I have on the slide will show you pictures from the last 10 years that are of different protests and in which in each case, there's a clear disregard for the uh, humanity and for the civil rights, human rights of black Americans. So these things have been going on. You see in the far left corner of this picture is a protest that says demand justice for Rodney King. I'm gonna come back to that because that's a really important moment to think about this kind of recent history of the concept of race and its relationship to intergroup dynamics in the US. But the thing that was different about this last year in 2020, one was the kind of the types of people were taking place in the protests. There was, it wasn't just young people or young minority people taking place in these protests. There was a whole diverse spectrum of people taking place in protests just because of the, over, the overwhelming, wow, that was great. Crazy echo. All right. So, that, so the other thing that was crazy about last year is that similar solidarity protests emerged in Europe. There were protests in Amsterdam. There was protests in London. There were protests in France. So there were a lot of interest in these ideas around like, why did these protests happen in Europe? And of course, the immediate things that we've seen recently is there's a bit of a backlash, right? The idea is that, well, don't just import these American US-based kind of problems and issues into Europe and thinking that they work exactly the same way here. And there's been quite a bit of a backlash even very recently towards US academics and social scientists who work on these issues in the US and there's been a bit of a reluctance to really think about those things down in European context. And of course, this backlash was highlighted last week with the, fresh, uh, with the French ministry starting investigations in social science research conducted in France. And, and, and even the president of France, as you may be aware of, saying that you know, there is this real kind of problem of American-based ideas and concepts and theories, specifically singling out critical race theories, theories yeah. around gender and post-colonialism as being very disruptive to European societies and exacerbating divides and creating divisions that are not there. Now that statement, it's I'm paraphrasing of course, that statement assumes that these, that these societies in Europe have no divisions and that the importing of these theories may now start creating divisions. So what I wanted to do then today was let's take a moment and think about and share about what are all these things in America that these social scientists are always raving about and doing research about. What is this all about, the concept of race, and how has it applied to immigration? Because in the US case, immigration and race have always been interwoven, despite the fact that they've been studied in separate subfields. They've always been intrinsically combined together in how social life and social organization of American societies, societies unfolded. So these are a couple of two questions that kind of motivate today's talk, or just to think through some of these ideas. And in many ways, I'm, I'm delighted it's a public seminar because I'm really looking forward to the Q&A because I think that in terms of thinking about these ideas from an American context and thinking how they might work in Europe, that's a conversation that, that's happening now and needs to happen. There's no clear way of how this is going to work and it requires an iterative kind of exchange. So here are the two things to maybe think about and maybe we can come back to it in the Q&A. So one is what does race mean in everyday life? Like what does it mean in different places? Like does that term mean anything? Because it means different things to different people depending where you go. And the second part about it, which is closer to what my interest is as a social scientist, is that how can social scientists accurately measure, interpret, and theorize the lived experiences of minority status groups across the globe? So whatever that status minority status is, and that's part of the challenge here of, of, of what social scientists like myself and others that are interested in this are grappling with, which is how to come up with the terminology and the operationalization to create a way to study intergroup dynamics in different societies without having to say that it's race or saying it's this specific term, but being a little bit more fluid in the terminology and how, how the applications are used in empirical research. So let me move that into this a bit. So how are there intersections of race and immigration? So there's a few different ways that this has been thought about by migration scholars that work on intersections of race and people that work more in the critical race traditions in the United States. So the first is that racial classifications, this idea of creating categories, whether it's black, white, Asian, brown, regardless of what it is, that this the idea of classifications of humans and of groups and places of the world are legacies of the colonial era 
these legacies were used in the past to establish and maintain certain group level hierarchies that were essential in order to create and maintain the relationship between the colonizer and the colonized. Now, those hierarchies were institutionalized in the initial social organization of the United States. So these were the British colonial hierarchies that were put in place, brought to the United States when the United States was a British colony. And those were the foundational ways that society was organized around three groups, the European, the indigenous, and the African. And most, if you look at the history of the United States in the 17th century, 18th century, those are the main categories of how life is structured in the US. The critical race scholars have argued that, that those structuring didn't just go away, they just modified. And, they, and certain things stayed in place from, this, from the earlier part of the country's settlement. And then that brings us back then to how this might affect Europe. Well, in the US, the argument from many scholars is increasingly that these colonial era kind of legacies have remained. And what we're seeing some scholars arguing now in Europe, and some of this may be why there is sensitivity to some of these ideas, is that the colonial era kind of hierarchies that were in place in the colonized lands, in the colonized world, they have effectively been imported back with the post-colonial migration and have kind of reasserted themselves now as group hierarchies in Western Europe, in modern societies here in the 21st century. And again, these are claims that have been made and evidence is still being collected to figure out to what extent that these things work. So let's stop now and go back and think where we got to this. How did we get to this point? So in terms of the US, how we got to this type of way, I wanna spend some time on this now before coming back to how it might relate to, to Europe. So, some of this may be review for many of you, and I apologize, I'll go through very quickly for those of you that might not be familiar with this, but in terms of immigration to North America or United States, it went through a couple of different eras. The beginning started with mainly British, Irish, German immigration in the 17th, 18th centuries. And of course, the importation of Africans in, as, as slaves to the, to the continental United States and to the West Indies and to various other British colonies. That migration was then modified and expanded to include more people from Northwestern Europe, many Scandinavians immigrated as, as well as many Dutch who actually founded my university in 1766. My university was, and Princeton were founded by the Dutch Reformed Church. And then finally, in the late 19th century, you have many people starting to migrate from Southern and Eastern Europe, and as well as from China and Japan, and from India, Punjabi Indians who came to the West Coast under British colonial rule. So that's the initial immigration. And the way that assimilation theory and research evolved in the United States was that this provided the actual kind of natural laboratory for understanding how these intergroup processes were unfolding in the early 20th century, at the, at the late 19th, early 20th century, because all these immigrants were arriving to large growing cities in the Eastern and the Midwestern United States, places like New York, Chicago. And we were in the midst, the United States, as well as other parts of a pretty large industrial revolution. We had a lot of production, a lot of, lot of jobs, a lot of job opportunities, a lot of demand for low skilled types of labor. So there was a nice match in that sense that many of the migrants coming from Europe at that time were effectively low skilled. And there was a good supply, good demand. We achieved a sense of an equilibrium the way that some labor economists like to think about this era. Again, this is something that was characteristic of life in American society in the early 20th centuries in these cities is that you have this large kind of influx of immigrants moving in. And the first empirical study of this came from the University of Chicago by at that time, the kind of the early beginnings of sociology. And it was a study about Polish immigrants and the book's called The Polish Peasant in Europe and America. And what these sociologists tried to theorize was the entire process of immigration and the integration. And it centered on an idea of alienation. And the idea here was that the pre-migration life in Poland had certain level types of stability, coherence, it was organized. But the migration, the process of leaving, coming to the United States, trying to settle, get settled in these large places like Chicago, it created a whole lot of traumas and a lot of dislocations. This was theorized then as this is a period of disorganization that would then, according to the theory, be followed by a reorganization that would happen through acculturation and then through assimilation into American society. This was the first formulation of this way of thinking that, that assimilation is a process. And the reason why it was important or significant at the time in the beginnings of social science in the United States is that this in some ways challenged the idea that immigration and the ideas about settlement acculturation are purely just an individual level thing it actually showed that this is actually a process that's happening. This isn't purely by individual psychology. 
it's a it's a process that requires a different kind of lens. And of course, these folks argue that the lens was sociology. It required a sociological analysis to understand how this process unfolds. Now, the part that's sometimes not described enough in the classic literature is that the European immigration to the United States that was happening, the context of, our, of American society in the early 20th century, was a place that was in a, in a period of, of significant boundary making. And the boundary was really around blackness and whiteness and the idea that the society needed to have a very strict and bright boundary between blacks and whites. And this early era of European immigration also was happening at a time when the US government was first creating its first kind of racialized boundary in law towards Chinese and Japanese immigrants. So in 1888, it was the first kind of anti-immigrant exclusion law was passed in the United States, which stopped all future Chinese immigration. And that followed a large campaign of terrorism and violence directed against Chinese immigrants in the Western United States. This was followed later by a similar agreement to stop Japanese immigration. So you have the kind of restricting of the United States on the Western side of no more new Chinese Asian immigrants. And you have increasing immigration from Europe coming on in the Eastern side. And what you have in the middle is this new US that's forming in the early 20th century, which is the apparatus of segregationist logic in the United States. It's basically the creation of the institutional, cultural, everyday life system of separation between blacks and whites. Now, this starts, of course, shortly after the US Civil War, which after that ends the slavery and these things are abolished and outlawed. And there's a period of reconstruction that happens. But very shortly after that, there's a general acceptance that there needs to be some kind of separation created. And this isn't just in the rural South. This is across many areas of the country. There's this sense. So there is widespread adherence and acceptance in the general American society for legal and institutional rationales for segregation. And this helps the implementation of many types of laws that kind of institutionalize this separation, creating penalties for violation of that. And of course, this follows things that you may have seen in history books or seen where there is a, a very strict segregation of how people can use public accommodation, public, public transport. And in some of my recent work I've been doing, it seems that there was a very clear concerted effort amongst the advertising industry and the marketing professionals, this was a new thing in the early 20th century, to create a very clearly segregated consumer marketplace in the United States. So this is something that's not quite as well known in the history of segregation, but one of the places where this was really being activated and remained in place, a very clear racial hierarchy and a kind of segregated outlook on how US society looks was in marketing and advertising. And it remained really till the end of the 20th century in, some, to some extent still in place. But the point here is that like there was a general societal push towards endorsing and embracing segregation in the US society. And again, this is the time when all of these immigrants are moving into the US society. And at the same time, you have a legitimization and activization of racist violence and terrorism all over the United States, primarily against black Americans, but also against Native American, indigenous Americans and Latino Americans in the Western United States. These are the contexts in which this new assimilation is starting to happen for European immigrants that are coming in. Now, there's two trajectories that happen in the scholarship in the social science world of America in the early 20th centuries. There is a scholarship emerging, which is about the critical study of race. And that is led by one of the founders of sociology in the United States, W.E.B. Du Bois, who would go on to form, become a very important activist and large person in the overall kind of push for reform and racial forms in much of the 20th century. But W. Du Bois provided the first kind of empirical examples on how to use quantitative data, statistical data, how to look and see how inequality was working in his book, The Philadelphia Negro, and in other studies that he did in the city of Atlanta. And this is this history is not only now being kind of re realized and people are coming back to it, seeing how like a lot of the kind of blueprints of what a lot of people are studying now were actually there in a lot of Du Bois' early research on how to do it. And he's starting to receive more, uh, uh, I would say, recognition as a founder of the discipline just because of the influence of his writings. So this was one strand that emerged. But at the same time, a different strand was emerging to response to all these social changes that were happening. And that, that strand was less focused on the um, 
was less focused on the uh, on race, and it was more focused on immigration and, and, and the ideas of immigrants and what was happening. And this was in the Chicago, in the University of Chicago, where there was a real focus on understanding what the assimilation process was that was unfolding between Irish immigrants, Italian immigrants, Polish immigrants, and, and just the general native population that was there. So this started in the early 20th century, the uh, University of Chicago, and the uh, first kind of incarnation of this came from a scholar named Robert Park, and they, and they understood assimilation as a process that was relative to groups that are even white, and that and that it was something where people would lose all the differences that were that, that defined their ethnic cultures, and they would soon just become like a general America. I mean, this is the kind of the general idea about this. Now, again, the empirical research that people are relying on again is the experiences of European immigrants and their children, their U.S.-born children, in the early 20th century. And again, from what we've just kind of went over, this is happening in the context of some very, very uh, bright and rigid racial boundaries that are being formed in U.S. society. Now, these ideas get really further developed and really formalized as a theory of assimilation later in the 1960s, when another sociologist named Milton Gordon takes these ideas from the Chicago School and re really uses empirical survey data on second generation immigrants from Europe and starts putting together a process or stage-like process of how assimilation and acculturation operate. And his, he provided this model that has actually seven stages. The first was called the acculturation stage, which was he uh, assumed that when immigrants will start learning the culture, learning the core values, understanding the language. This would then be followed by a structural type of integration, which he meant would refer to people getting jobs, getting into the labor market. This would be followed then by marital uh, assimilation. And here specifically, uh, he was speaking about people marrying outside of their ethnic groups. So the more that that happens, the more assimilation into an American kind of identity can take place. This would be followed by a feeling of a sharedness, a collectivity, really around maybe the nation or other types of identities that bring people beyond their ethnic identities. They blur those, those types of identities. But here are the other two kind of key parts that Gordon was also very uh, sensitive to, which is that for that process to happen, there needs to be no prejudice. There needs to be no, he called it attitude reception. Well, effectively what he meant was that the attitude needs to be receptive to this group and there needs to be no active discrimination. And if those conditions are met and all the other, other steps are happen, the final stage will happen, which to Gordon was the uh, symbolic, the symbolism of, of an immigrant group that is fully assimilated, which was civic and political kind of integration. And it's important to note that in many ways, this book came out in 1964, and it's coming right at a time when like, you're seeing this exact process happening for Catholics in the United States, and specifically for Irish Catholics, because in 1960, the first Irish Catholic is elected president. So, so, the, so for the scholars that are doing this research, they see a very linear, clean, kind of successive kind of over uh, assimilation of Catholics over two generations. And this, again, is the kind of motivation for the way that these theories that unfolded. And this is the general idea that came out of all of this work from the early 20th century on assimilation, was that assimilation is a linear process that unfolds over generations, and that in general, the way that the data looks and the way that the patterns have looked for Europeans, it's a positive process that happens. Most folks are just moving along. Now, again, this research and this scholarship, again, is not about race. So it's not in that it's in a completely separate kind of immigration scholarship area. So there's never really a much of a discussion about the fact that, well, this is happening at a time when there are these very, very rigid racial boundaries that are there. So that is giving, in some ways, an advantage to all of the European immigrants because none of them are Black and none of them are Latino. Again, that's under theorizing this research. And that is, 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 are some of, the, some of the themes that animate more theories that are, that are developed later in the 20th century, in the early 20th century, on assimilation. So we go back to the 60s now. We've got these pretty prominent scholars in America that have come up with these assimilation theories. You know, at that time, there was a bit more of an of a exchange between many of these scholars and the government. So they're, they're, they're also having influence policies. And you have major social upheaval happening in the United States. You have the civil rights reforms that are happening in the 60s. And then you have a very large reform that happens that ends up really having a dramatic uh, impact on just changing the racial, ethno-racial kind of makeup of U.S. society, which is the passing of the Hart-Celler Act in 1965. This is the act that effectively 
removes the immigration restrictions that the US government had put in place in 1924. At that time, restriction had been put in place to stop European immigration. And then because of the Great Depression and because of the, of the two world wars, immigration in Europe effectively had just dwindled. But these restrictions were still in place and they were based on national origin quotas. So they effectively were a, a form of a kind of race-based policy in the law. One of the kind of key ideas in the civil rights legislation was to eliminate race-based policies, national origin types of policies in the actual laws. So that was on, that's the heels where these acts came. And this effectively opened up legal immigration to the United States from Asia, from Latin America, from a variety of countries that had effectively been banned, or at least their immigration had been restricted to, to set of specific quotas that generally favored Northwestern European countries over other countries in the global South. This graph will show you how rapidly American society changed from the 1970 to the, to the end of the 20th century. You'll see in 1960, if you look at the, the graphic here on your left or your right, the one with the pie charts, you'll see that the overall makeup of US society in 1960 was 84% of the origins of the immigrant population was from Europe or Canada. But you'll see in 2013 that one, it's much more distributed evenly. I mean, there's a much more diverse kind of makeup. Um, Mexico still accounts for the largest proportion in other Latin American countries. But of course, what you'll notice is that Europe and Canada is now at 14%. So in general, the foreign born population has been steadily increasing in the United States and the ethno-racial diversity of the American population has also been increasing and diversifying over the last four decades. So what you see then is a rapid transformation of gateway cities in the United States, places like New York, Chicago, Los Angeles, and you see a lot of this kind of uh, uh, growth in terms of the ethno-racial diversity, in terms of like the cultures, in terms of the linguistic diversity of these cities. There's a lot of this happening, but it's happening at a time when the United States is also kind of contracting in many ways in terms of like its position economically, in terms of what's happening in the domestic economy. There is successive uh, periods of stagnant wages. There's growing unemployment, specifically in the urban areas where many of these immigrant groups and domestic minority groups are, are concentrated. And then there's also increasingly intergroup tensions emerging because many of the immigrants that are coming to the United States in the 1960s, 70s, 80s from Asia and even from Latin America, they are what migration calls positively selected, right? So they are not the, they're not the poorest people in their countries. They're actually probably some of the most positively outgoing type of folks that are actually migrating. So when they're coming into close proximity with domestic minority groups in the United States that have been subjected to centuries of, of oppression and various forms of institutional discrimination, there is a uneven kind of advantage the immigrants have. And those start to create tensions in these large cities. This all kind of starts to really come to, well, here's some pictures, right? Oh, the other thing that I wanted to highlight here is aside from all of the economic decay and things happening in these cities, is there's also, because of all this immigration, a kind of real resurgence of ethnic enclaves in a lot of the large metropolitan cities in the United States. And again, these are growing enclaves. Now, there were always immigrant kind of ethnic enclaves in many US cities, especially in the early 20th century, there were many European enclaves. But by the 1990s, many of those European enclaves have actually now been populated with new immigrant groups. So you see like Chinatowns coming up, you see other types of, uh, other types of areas that have different ethnic concentrations. And this is another new feature of many large urban areas in the United States. Now, the 1980s and 90s are also a time where all this immigration and all this kind of changes are happening. There's also this large ramped up militarization of police forces in the United States. And I'm not a criminologist or expert on policing or anything like that, but you can look this up. It's a very clear, you can see that if you look at the graph here, there was a pretty significant surge in crime in the United States in the, in the 1970s and in the 80s and even into the 90s, primarily in large urban areas. So there was this, decades long justification for increasing more law enforcement, being very tough on crime. We had war on drugs, war on crime. This happened, you know, across administrations. So really it's a bipartisan kind of issue for a very long time. And in general, there's been just this increasing militarization and just an increasing kind of use of very excessive force with police departments in large cities, specifically with Latino, Latinx, Native American, and with, and with Black American communities. Now, all of these kind of large issues come together in 1992 when a couple of major things happen. 
in one of these new large immigrant gateways in America, Los Angeles. Okay, so one, in 1991, there is a filmed videotape beating of a black murderist by one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like 10 LAPD police officers. Four are actually charged with the crime. They are tried in Simi Valley, a very, very, not, not a very diverse place in, in Los Angeles County, and they are all acquitted of the charges. There is international outrage about this all over the place, but what happens shortly after that are there are major uh, disruptances and uh, mobilization and rioting, and riots end up lasting for about a week. It's the deadliest riot in US history. It brings back a lot of the images of the 1960s. And of course, all of this is, is creating a lot of like, like tensions and problems in the, not only in the society, but amongst the scholars that have been working on this, right? Because many of the kind of narratives up to that point was that there had been so many changes and progressive reforms in the civil rights era, but all of these things unfolding start to question all that, both in, the, in terms of academics working on this and of course in, in the general public as well. But one of the other things that emerged out of this deadly riot was a new kind of awakening of intergroup conflict and tensions. And specifically in Los Angeles, in these riots, the tension was between Korean immigrant communities and Black, Black Americans living in largely high concentrated Black areas where many Korean immigrants owned shops and owned commercial properties and owned different types of um, businesses there. So the, the same year that the Rodney King uh, beating happens, there is a shooting of a young teenager, black teenager, by, by a Korean immigrant shop owner who is also not given, given any kind of serious penalty for doing this. So there's a lot of this growing animosity. And during the actual riot, there becomes increasingly, um, there becomes increasing violent exchanges between Korean shop owners and all various forms of rioters, including open gunfire, open warfare. If you go on YouTube and look these things up, you can watch the videos of it. It's pretty frightening. I'm an American. It's frightening to look at it, seeing that, wow, this is America. But this is what's happening. And these intergroup conflicts that emerge, they start creating new ripples in the overall hierarchy, the organization of groups in the United States. Asians are very quickly start to become celebrated by many of the kind of conservative Republican kind of think tanks in the United States really as model minorities. In fact, in this last summer, during all of these riots that were happening, there were memes of these images that I just showed, showing like how really like celebrating these Koreans for what strong cowboys they were, how they were dealing with black rioters in LA and stuff. So the Asian Americans emerged in the 1990s as this had a new group that are called model minorities. And there's this a lot of this kind of discussion about how they are just better, their cultures are, are just so much better or, or, or more conducive to success relative to black culture or Latino culture. And this becomes a very large kind of talking point amongst a lot of certain types of intellectuals. And this starts to have an influence in the academy as well. And people start to really question all of this immigration is happening in so many different ways now because it's so ethno-racially and geographically diverse. Do these classic assimilation theories still work? Because obviously that's not what we're seeing. We don't see this kind of like nice steady social mobility cross generations happening for all these different immigrant groups in the US. So scholars in the 90s started to reassess this and the, what came out of this was a theory called segmented assimilation. And it was produced by two very prominent sociologists and has continued to be one of the kind of key theories that's used to study immigrant integration in the US and to some extent also in Western Europe. What they argued was that the way that things had changed in America, that there was no longer just one pathway for assimilation. Now there were multiple pathways and three in particular. One, they said, they argued that people are still experiencing the regular standard assimilation, the social mobility cross generations. However, there are other groups that are not experiencing that. And it seems that as each generation goes, they may be actually going, getting worse than the, per, per, than the immigrant genera generation of the parents, that they may be actually incorporating into kind of like a permanent poverty or something of what they called a urban underclass. That was the word that they used. And then the third outcome they saw was that some immigrants and their children are remaining in these types of enclave neighborhoods and they're being selective or they are alert, they are adapting to some aspects of the host society, yet they're keeping some aspects of their ethnic cultures intact, and that they seem to be assimilating yet slower. So there's what they call like a delayed assimilation. So this helped kind of create a little bit more 
nuance in the sense of how the assimilation process is going to work in the U.S. now as we ended the 20, as we get to the end of the 20th century and the ethno-racial diversity of the country is changing and there's all these new intergroup conflicts. However, these ideas didn't really get at the whole point about the elephant in the room, which is the intergroup tensions that are emerging between immigrant groups, specifically Asian immigrant groups, and these domestic minority groups, specifically Black Americans and Latinx Americans. These theories in the immigration field didn't really get at that because again, people in this field weren't working on issues related to race relations, intergroup dynamics. And that's where we started to see that in the field of race, in these areas of people that are working in this in the 1990s, that there was a resurgence of scholars that were interested in pursuing theories and theory building about how the process of race works. And this is a departure because if you think about like the way scholarship unfolded both in Europe and the US in the 1970s and 80s, it was really, and even in the 90s, right? It was really a time of, of a celebration of postmodernism and deconstruction and post-structuralism and really just a kind of a, a generally a, a reluctance to engage in any kind of grand theorizing or any kind of meta theorizing. And even when you say it today, people start getting uncomfortable if you start talking about we want to meta theorize something. Well, in the 1990s, certain scholars thought that actually it was important to try to think about a way to theorize or, the or build theory about how the race is operating as a structure in the United States, but also more importantly, how it's effectively a whole set of processes. Like what is race? It's really, it's nothing. It's really just a whole set of processes that create a race. So people wanted to start theorizing, how does it work? And the 1990s was a very important time in, in, in the field in the sense that many important ideas were emerged that have continued to have a lot of influence today. So the first was just kind of asserting that, that this idea that has become pretty common, everybody's, everyone understands this, but in the 90s, it was still a new thing to say that race is a social construction. So that was one of the ideas that came out of this where people started to be, started to be very clear that, that there is no real kind of biological kind of differences to this, that it's really the social construction. And the job of the social scientist is to understand how the construction is unfolding. What are the parameters of that social construction? And what are the different factors that make it vary and change? The other thing that many of these scholars were specifically uh, posing a challenge to mainstream sociologists in the United States was that race was the master status. Of, uh, or you could think of as a principal factor of social organization. And this was a challenge because at the time, and even to some extent today, there is a kind of debate whether class is the real kind of thing that is the driver of inequality in the United States, or is it race? Now, of course, the two kind of correspond and are, they're highly correlated, yet it continues theoretically in academic circles to be a debate. Well, these folks in the 90s made, made a stand and said, no, it's not class. It is race. Race is the number one thing. So that, that was something that was a bit new in the sense of making that kind of pronouncement. Now, from that, the idea came, this concept racialization emerged, which was, again, the process. And here's what this, it's defined many different ways. This, this, this is one definition, which is, again, not great, but it's not too bad. Uh, I'll read it. It says the process of imparting social and symbolic meaning to perceived phenotypical and or cultural differences that could be skin color or religion. And then the extension of these meanings to a social category or group. And there's a common kind of common thing that's often said in some of this work is that, you know, there is no race. There's only racialization processes. Like these ideas of the categories, they're really meaningless. It's all, it's all about the structures that, that give them meaning. And that's in some ways what the, what the social scientist is, is, is seeking to understand. Now, along with this kind of new found sense of, increasing the kind of the emphasis on race was an actual uh, effort to actually show the current contemporary structures of racial hierarchies in US society at the end of the 20th century. And this was mainly advanced by a sociologist named Eduardo Benia Silva. And he published an article and several other works using empirical census data and various types of data in US to show how the US was effectively structured as a racial hierarchy where whites and all groups that are perceived to be white they occupied the top positions in economies, while Black and Latino groups, as well as any groups that are perceived to be Black, were found in the lowest positions. This is like his general argument, and he's just shown it over decades through various forms of, of data, various types of methods to show how it works in different fields of social life. And of course, this has been picked up by other folks in other areas now as well. Now, along with this 
with these ideas then came the idea that how do we then think about these things together? We have all this segmented assimilation happening, and then we also have all these kind of larger structural organizational features of race. If we think immigrants are somehow not being affected by that, we're thinking about it with the wrong lens. So increasingly folks in the 21st century try to figure out ways to theorize immigration and race together. And as, as Dr. Siegel said in, in the beginning of the talk, they often aren't thought about together, but increasingly people have started to recognize that the two makes, there makes some both theoretical and empirical sense to start thinking about these two ideas together in the US in particular. And some of these ideas come around this idea of racialized incorporation. And an example and a definition of this is just that immigrants and their children are getting incorporated structurally into a society, but if that society is already kind of pre-existingly built on hierarchies, these immigrants are, are effectively being inserted into these hierarchies, or in some cases, maybe new groups are being created to absorb them into some kind of hierarchy. So this was this is a, a some of the research that is advancing this type of an idea is again trying to bring these two ideas together about, about race and immigration being interrelated. Now the way this works then is you look at, you know, scholars have looked at different kind of realms of economic activity, social activity, political, civic engagement, and they see, okay, so where do these immigrant groups lie? Because in the US, people are categorized as racial categories in the official kind of census, uh, census kind of data. But then we also ask people where they're born and we ask people where their children are born. So demographers and various people that use government data are able to ascertain people's birthplaces and give them a nationality and also to the second generation. Yet everyone is also required to still identify with the racial category. So people are still being sorted in there. So when you look at the kind of the, the juxtaposition of those two together, you start seeing what Bania Silva talks about, which is this kind of racialized hierarchy where you have the dominant mainstream group, which in the US is white Americans. And then you have a subordinate group at the bottom, which in the US is black Americans. And then you have a bunch of other groups, other race groups in the US, the race groups are Asian, Hispanics and non-Hispanics who can be broken into whites or blacks. They're all in different positions in the middle. And again, this is a bit simplistic, but it's more of just, it's more of a way that that scholars have tried to theorize how life chances are basically often unequal and often people are having unequal access to different types of resources. So this is one way that it's been done. Now, there's been a lot of stuff that's come out in the last couple of decades to try to advance this empirically, right? To like look at different ways to test it. Like, is this kind of incorporation happening? Some of the more convincing work has been done around Mexican Americans that has shown that with, uh, with each generation that you don't see the mobility the way that it's predicted and that there is quite a bit of downward mobility happening in different generations, specifically in the Southwest. Other studies have looked and seen how many of the children of West Indian immigrants end up having lower socioeconomic incorporation and have higher incidence of, of, of arrest and various types of infractions with the police than the parental generation, again, showing somewhat of a downward kind of integration. And I did work about five years ago seeing that many different immigrant groups that, that pursue entrepreneurship, because that's a very kind of celebratory avenue for social mobility in America is entrepreneurship, that even that very much is organized from these racial hierarchies where, you know, regardless of your skill level and your education, that, that we see non-white immigrant groups end up in pretty, pretty low prestige kind of industries when they do pursue self-employment in the US. So there's been quite a bit of research looking at how this hierarchy kind of looks in the, in the empirical world. And we've seen increasingly kind of that because of all of the, the relationship with police violence and with, with black and brown communities and the fact, as I said earlier, that there are a lot of immigrants in these communities, that increasingly people are also looking at how the racialized corporation is working for immigrants and their children in relation to policing and to police violence. So here are just some couple of figures to just, just share with you. So this is from, I can't remember, I think it's from the, this is from CMS. Black immigrants comprise 7.2% of the US non-citizen population, but make up only 20, they make up 20% 20 of cases in 2020. So that's a pretty crazy discrepancy. And a lot of these deportation cases are immigrants from the Dominican Republic and from Haiti and from West Indian countries. Here is a 2019 New York Civil Liberties Union report, which shows that NYPD use of force is the highest in New York City areas that have high proportions of Black Caribbeans and African immigrant communities. In the 1990s, there were, there were some very, very uh, terrible cases of police, anti-Black violence by police committed against specifically immigrants. 
Amadou Diallo and a couple others. And the other thing that's often sometimes underreported in the news media is there are very high rates of police violence against Latino migrants and, and, the, and the descendants of Latino migrants in California and other large states in the Southwest. And there was a Washington Post report that came out in 2020 showing that the Latino men were only second behind blacks as being 21 murdered by the police a year per million residents. So immigrants are, are indirectly also being affected directly by the actual police violence and the police forced to stop in these communities. And of course, the racialized incorporation in the in terms of recent news, if you follow the news or you see any of this stuff, is that we have very clear uh, racial and geographical disparities on how COVID is affecting communities in the United States. Latinx people in the US are four times more likely to need hospitalization because of COVID related sickness compared to whites. Immigrants that are concentrated in urban areas and rural agriculture areas they've been hit hard because that's where that's where this has been spreading the most. And we also have seen high rates of death in many of these communities because in the case of Latinx communities, many people have been afraid or reluctant to seek care from healthcare professionals, especially, I mean, for the most of 2020 because of the fear of the kind of Trump administration's kind of approach to deportation. Now, the reason I've laid this all out is that Increasingly, there is this active effort amongst US scholars to develop theories that could help us understand these group dynamics in a comparative sense. And that's coming mainly through transatlantic research on the racialization and the integration of immigrant communities. Now, of course, there's a lot of challenges to doing this. First of all, I mean, just in terms of data limitations, but secondly, also epistemological and theoretically, there are challenges to doing this in the sense that the societies are, are different. There are many differences between Western Europe and the United States, historically and contemporarily. Immigrant groups are different. The context of immigration are different. There's a lot of difference of why they were. But that's kind of the reason why theoretically it's important to do the comparison. And it comes from the sociology of George Simmel, who was a very influential early 20th century sociologist in the sense of thinking about social pattern analysis. So if we can see some kind of, we can see many different cases that are very different, yet we still see the same pattern, that's meaningful in a sociological sense. So there's this renewed push to try to kind of explore ways to think about a comparative approach to study race or any kind of term you want to use for intergroup dynamics. But of course, it's contested, right? Because I don't need to tell this audience, race is a very controversial term, right? To use in Europe in an academic sense or in a public sense, right? So that, that's a challenge, right? Nobody wants to talk about it. Right. So let's talk about it, though, for today, just for a second, or let's just consider it. So let's just consider way the intergroup might work in a European context without talking about the word race. So we can think of then ascribe status markers, right, that, that, that exist, that anybody sees when you interact with anyone face to face, right, things like skin color, maybe religion, if somebody is visibly, right, wearing a hijab or wearing a veil or something, then maybe religion's a salient characteristic, of course, nationality, ethnicity, these are all subscribed status markers that you could easily put in place of race, and we might find similar, similar types of processes, we could think about some of these kind of terms that exist in a European context, which, if you're looking at the way these things work in the US, there are some very strong parallels here. So when we think about Southern and Northern Europe, right, we think about that distinction. Of course, when we think about Muslims or Islam, that's very clear boundary, it's a really old one. But also when you just, when you say Moroccan, like it's, it's not just a nationality, it becomes more, it has a more symbolic kind of a nature. Same with Turks, right? Or Serna or Syrian refugees. These are all scriptive markers that, 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 that have more symbolic meanings than actually probably what they actually refer to when people are using them, but they're powerful, right? And they're, they're, the 20th century was kind of, had many of these types of categories that you can see how they shaped the integration experiences of immigrants in, in Europe, guest workers, foreigners, person with that migrant background. So, I mean, any way you cut it, there are ways that groups are going to be divided and categorized in modern societies. Even if you don't use race classifications like the United States, and I'm, sh I'm curious to actually in the Q&A to learn more from you if possible about what are some of these kinds of categories that you have noticed and you see that are maybe operating in similar ways. Now, of course, people have been trying to look and see like how do process of racialization and racist corporation work in Europe. There have been empirical studies over the last two, you know, two decades using these ideas 
that have been developed in the United States, but trying to apply them to European data, to European cases. And here are just some of the things that have emerged from this, right? So basically, the racialization without race idea that you know there's a lot of Muslim disadvantage, it seems, in economic integration in France. The empirical studies that have been done, the few that have been done, these are some of the highlights from that from the study by Adida 2010. In France, a Muslim candidate is 2.5 times less likely to receive a job interview call back than his Christian counterpart. That sounds very familiar to black-white uh, 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 disparities and in interview callbacks in the United States. Here's another one. Second generation Muslim immigrants have lower income than Christian counterparts after controlling the skill level experience. What's interesting about some of these studies is that they compare Christian immigrants and, and Muslim immigrants. So they really are in some way identifying that the boundary that's working here is the religious boundary. It's not even the immigrant boundary, right? So this is some of the fascinating things that have come, a little bit of the insights we've got from the from some of the research that's emerging on these ideas. Here is a slide showing you know, wage differentials. You can look and see these differentials are pretty clear in terms of like where people are sitting in the labor market. See a similar thing in Germany, right? In terms of wage differentials and where folks lie. And here are some studies that were done by the Running Me Trust in the UK where we see it's very similar types of situations. It's just, it's just basically a pretty clear inequities in a whole different realms of social life. Um, ethnic minorities and immigrants in Britain are more likely than white to live in poor housing, have low levels of unemployment, have lower incomes. And according to these studies, evidence points to institutional discrimination, and employment is based. My own work, which is on the Pakistani immigrant community in the UK, it's very clear that there are many different ways that the word Paki, the word British Muslim, the word the British Asian, that these are categories that have, have many symbolic meanings and have been used for decades in institutional settings and policies in various ways to create all kinds of inequities that have remained for decades. Now, when we think about this racialized corporation, going back to the beginning of this talk now about like what's happening with Black Lives Matter protests in Europe, it seems that some of the shock and some of the confusion around the protests here, especially in the French context, seem a bit, they're a bit bewildering to me that, that, that they're so shocked in the sense that like there's been quite a bit of, of documented kind of bias amongst policing in, in France versus minority communities. And I think it, you can really trace it back to the beginning of the whole post-colonial migration experience of France. This is the picture from the 1961 massacre of Algerian protesters in Paris, estimated to two to 300 people murdered by the police. So, I mean, it's this isn't a new thing this is going on. In 2005, you'll all remember three weeks of rioting that, that followed after the electrocution of the teen, of two teenagers that, that were, were running away from the police. So it seems that like, that this is a thing I just saw yesterday of, of, of people who have been uh, who have been murdered by the police in the UK, who no, too many people know about, but these are new rallies that are being made to open new investigations into what happened. So of course, these are just a few cases and this is nowhere enough to suggest that there's any commonality with what's happening in the US. And of course, in terms of scale, there's no comparison that the scale of these situations in the United States is far more severe. Uh, our police is militarized and, and just the situation in our country is different than anywhere else in the world. However, it still begs the question that comparative research on policing or these kind of interactions, that they're probably needed in some ways to understand how these biases work. And from the comparative kind of theory building perspective of, of critical race studies, it's, it's important to see like how power dynamics are are there similarities? How do they similar? How do they vary across these different contexts? And what that has to do with the historical kind of situation in these different countries. Now, I want to finish now or close this out by kind of presenting with you something I'm working on in terms of a theoretical way to think about doing comparative work on intergroup inequities, intergroup disparities. And one of the ideas that I've been working on is this notion of an ascriptive kind of status. So instead of just automatically taking these terms like race or racial inequality and just like talking about racial inequality in France or racial inequality in, in places where people don't use that term or say racial inequality in Italy, Italy where there's a real aversion to the term race, that perhaps a way to get around that and a way to maybe think a bit more nuanced about how these kind of group categories get formed and what, and their, and what the meanings are, one of my ideas I've been thinking is to think more about ascriptive kind of status markers. So, just so to be clear, so I'm not talking about 
things you achieve, right? So this is in contrast to things like your merit or, your, or, or sickness or skills, your profession. Descriptive status markers are things that come through descent. They're things that, 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 that you're born with. They come through family ancestry. You know, we can think of examples could be race if that's what's the if that's a useful classification in the context we're talking, but it could easily be ethnicity, it could be nationality. In some cases, it could be religious identity or some kind of cultural orientation. But when, use, when we think about it in terms of an ascriptive marker and what the effect of that marker is or how salient it is in terms of institutions or in terms of lived experiences, it may give us a certain kind of theoretical leverage that makes it possible to engage in more comparative work and doesn't get held up with the kind of terminology and the and the conceptual problems with just taking concepts from one society and putting them in another. But we know that's not a good idea. So this is possibly a way to maybe get around that. And I want to propose that a way of doing this could be just with these following kind of assumptions that an ascriptive status reflects a group level recognition of symbolic boundaries and that these boundaries would correspond to some kind of category, right? And that it'd be important to consider that the particularities of these status markers, right? Like whatever they are or how silly they are, that they're going to vary. And that's part of the project is figuring out why they vary. Like why does the descriptive status matter this way? One example could be the term Asian. Asian, British Asian has a very negative connotation in, this, in the context of the United Kingdom. However, Asian is associated with high achievement and model minorities in the United States. It's the same term. It, more or less kind of refers to the same groups, yet it has completely different contexts, completely different connotations. This is an example of how a comparative study in this would help to understand why are they different and how did they become that way and what does that do today? What does the difference in that connotation mean for the lived experiences of these groups and their positionality in, in, in the overall hierarchy of that society? And finally, racialization processes may be investigated we can investigate these things by kind of focusing on the institutional dimension of these descriptive status markers. So are these status markers, do they matter? Like, are there actual laws and policies that specifically are focusing on a specific ascribed status marker? So in that case, if you've got policies that are obviously directedly targeting Muslims, yeah, we don't have to say they're racist because we're not talking about race, but they're still using an ascriptive marker, right? They're still based on a scriptive identity. So perhaps this is just, a, I mean, it's really more of a proposition, something I'm thinking through that is this maybe a way to start figuring out ways to harmonize data and, 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 and come up with concepts that can somewhat capture or bridge some of these national level differences. Okay, uh, I think I'm gonna stop because I'm, I'm gonna stop here and see what y'all have to say. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Ali. We really appreciate that and all the insights you've given on the U.S. context, but also how it can relate to the uh, um, the, the context in Europe, which I think has been really helpful.